coup at the White House. After that, we'll hear from the Prime Minister when he speaks at an American Enterprise Institute dinner. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention. Landmark Cases, C-SPAN's special history series produced in cooperation with the National Constitution Center, exploring the human stories and constitutional dramas behind 12 historic Supreme Court decisions. Number 759, Ernest Miranda... Petitioner versus Arizona. We'll hear arguments in number 18, Roe against Wade. Quite often, and many of our most famous decisions are ones that the court took that were quite uh, unpopular. Five, four, four, five. Please Let's go through a few cases that illustrate very dramatically and visually what it means to live in a society of 310 million different people who help stick together because they believe in a rule of law. Good evening and welcome to C-SPAN and the National Constitution Center's Landmark Cases. Tonight we're going to be examining a 1944 war powers case at the Supreme Court. It's the story of Korematsu versus the United States. Fred Korematsu was a Japanese-American who challenged the right of the government to forcibly detain People during World War II. You might know a bit about this history uh, and American uh, history during World War II. Many Japanese Americans uh, were gathered up, 120,000 by some estimates, uh, and detained through the course of the war. Fred Korematsu said that was not right and took it all the way to the Supreme Court. We're going to learn more about that case, and let me introduce you to two people who will be helping us learn the story. Peter Irons is a civil rights attorney. He is an author and editor of over 10 books, including Justice at War, the story of the Japanese-American internment cases. In the course of researching his book on the, uh, this case, he found proof that the government used tainted evidence to convict Fred for Korematsu and uh, to justify the internment of Japanese Americans and help overturn that conviction. Thanks for being here, Peter Irons. It's great to be here. Karen Korematsu is Fred's daughter, and she continues the family legacy as the executive director of the Fred Korematsu Institute in San Francisco, which does what? What is your mission? Uh, education, uh, civil rights and human rights education, uh, starting with K through 12 and into higher education and the general public. Well, we're glad to have you at the table tonight. Pleasure. We're going to start with the big picture. And, and when this came, uh, case came to the court, exactly what were they asked to decide? What was the issue? Well, the issue was whether the government could single out a particular group of people solely on the basis of their race or ethnicity and hold them in literally concentration camps uh, indefinitely without any due process, without uh, a hearing, a lawyer, a trial, and whether this was justified under the government's powers as, the, as they asserted it to protect the country from potential espionage or sabotage by members of this group. And it was an issue that uh, really at the time, uh, very few people, particularly outside of the West Coast, had any real knowledge of Japanese Americans. And they sort of thought, well, this group, they look like the enemy, and they may actually support the Japanese. So it's better to round them up and put them away. Uh, and the president has the power to do this under the war powers of the Constitution. That was the issue. What makes it a landmark case? Well, it's a landmark case because, first of all, the Supreme Court, in a 6-3 to three ruling upheld the government's power to do this. And Fred Korematsu's conviction for, for violating the order that he report to these internment camps, uh, the court upheld that. And that set a precedent. Now, we could say today, oh, that's very unlikely to happen again. Uh, this is just an aberration in our constitutional history. But I don't really think it is. For one thing, even Justice Antonin Scalia recently said, this could happen again. Uh, so we have to be on the on the lookout and the alert at all times. Are we in a situation where some other group, whether it's Arab Americans or any other group, comes under this kind of, of hostility and scrutiny? And as one of the Supreme Court justices dissenting in the case said, 
This principle lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority with a plausible reason. Looking at the history of the time, as you have studied it, Karen Korematsu, is uh, was this particular to Japanese Americans? I mean, on the East Coast, there were threats of German submarines coming to the United States. Were German Americans ever rounded up or thought to be rounded up? Why were Japanese Americans singled out? Well, there were some German Americans and Italian Americans or, and, uh, that were uh, were put into some of the uh, uh, prisons and, and camps, but they were on a case by case basis. Uh, with the Japanese Americans. Uh, they were singled out just because they, you know, quote, looked like the enemy. Uh, and, uh, and so, therefore, that was, that was why they were rounded up uh, without any due process and, and put in these American concentration camps. So it was racially based? It was racially based. And even uh, uh, Justice uh, Robert Jackson and Murphy, uh, even in their decisions, said that it had to do with racial discrimination. Well, Peter Irons, will you tell us in, in your book that there was a long history of, uh, sort of bias prejudice towards uh, Asians coming to the United States? Remember back in the 1880s, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Right. So set the stage before the 1940s of the feeling of majority white Americans, especially on the, white, uh, the West Coast, for uh, Asians coming to this country. Well, there had been, as you said, Susan, there had been hostility toward Asian Americans ever since Chinese immigrants came to this country. Largely, they worked on the railroads and in the mines and, and uh, in agriculture. Um, but there was a very powerful nativist movement, uh, and it, largely from organized labor, uh, which is sort of odd, uh, because they saw them as competition, low-wage competition. And so, as you said, Congress passed a law in the 1880s, the Chinese Exclusion Act. At that time, there were very few Japanese Americans. But when they started coming to this country around the turn of the 20th century, uh, in larger numbers, uh, Congress actually passed a law singling them out as what they called aliens ineligible for citizenship. Japanese were the only people who could not become naturalized citizens. And so they remained aliens. Many of them had lived in this country for many, many years. They were loyal to this country. They brought up their children to be loyal Americans. And, of course, the children who were born here were birthright citizens. Uh, that's a somewhat controversial topic now, but uh, they were American citizens. And so, but the hostility, particularly when Japan became aggressive in, in Asia toward uh, China, Manchuria, and so forth, and people began to uh, fear that there might be some uh, outbreak of, of war hostility with the Japanese. Um, but the interesting thing is, after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, for more than a month, there was no organized call to deport or intern or round up Japanese Americans. And the newspapers were saying... Um, they're loyal Americans. We're, we don't need to give in to the fears. But then the Hearst Press on the West Coast and, and politicians started saying, we have to, and the Farmer Grower Association in California, they said, this is white man's country. They actually said that. Um, so this began to build up and exerted pressure on President Roosevelt, who finally capitulated and issued the order uh, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute, uh, that gave the military the power to uh, detain, exclude any person of any ancestry, but only Japanese Americans were singled out. Peter just touched on uh, uh, the, really the backstory that needs to be emphasized, especially with the, with the agriculture. The, the, the Japanese were doing so well up and down the West Coast. That, uh, that a lot of people were very jealous. They, you know, it was kind of what we hear today. They're taking away our, our jobs. You know, they're taking away our, our, uh, our opportunity, our, our land. And uh, you know, as, as we do in this country, we go into to other countries where we can get cheap labor. And, uh, and especially before Japan at the turn of the century when the economy was very poor, they went into the, uh, the prefectures of the counties where it was highly agriculture and said, you know, come, come to, to, uh, to America and the land of opportunity. And that's how my grandfather uh, came to, uh, to the West Coast. 
uh, no different than what they did to the Chinese and now what we're doing, especially for the Mexicans that come, come up from Mexico. So if you've been watching the series with us, you know an important part of it is your involvement in it. There's three ways you can do it. You can call us, and in, in probably about 15 minutes or so, we'll begin taking calls. Eastern and t- Central time zones, 202-748-8900. If you live in the Mountain or Pacific time zones, 202-748-8901. Please dial those numbers carefully. And you can also send us a tweet at C-SPAN and use the hashtag LandmarkCases. We'll mix your Twitter questions and comments in throughout the program. And you can also join us by Facebook. There's already a discussion underway. C-SPAN's Facebook page, you'll see the Korematsu video, and the comments are already lining up under there. So please join us in this conversation on Korematsu versus the United States, the right of the government during a time of war uh, uh, to, uh, to take away civil liberties. That's really what the question is here and has lots of important elements for our own society today. So we're going to show a video uh, that is about the Pearl Harbor attack, and this is a government film on Japanese relocation. Let's watch. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our West Coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. Now the actual migration got underway. The Army provided fleets of vans to transport household belongings, and buses to move the people to assembly centers. The evacuees cooperated wholeheartedly. Behind them, they left shops and homes they had occupied for many years. Now they were taken to racetracks and fairgrounds where the Army almost overnight had built assembly centers. They lived here until new pioneer communities could be completed on federally owned lands in the interior. The Army provided housing and plenty of healthful, nourishing food for all. At each relocation center, evacuees were met by an advanced contingent of Japanese who had arrived some days earlier and who now acted as guides. Naturally, the newcomers looked about with some curiosity. They were in a new area, on land that was raw, untamed, but full of opportunity. Here they would build schools, educate their children, reclaim the desert. Now, This brief picture is actually the prologue to a story that is yet to be told. The full story will begin to unfold when the raw lands of the desert turn green, when all adult hands are at productive work on public lands or in private employment. It will be fully told only when circumstances permit the loyal American citizens once again to enjoy the freedom we in this country cherish, and when the disloyal, we hope, have left this country for good. In the meantime, we are setting a standard for the rest of the world in the treatment of people who may have loyalties to an enemy nation. So there we see the government's take on all of this. Uh, How was the country reacting once the order was given? Well, the reaction was uh, actually very unusual because, as the propaganda film said, uh, the vast majority of Japanese Americans cooperated because they had no choice. Where else could they go? What would happen to them? And what would happen to their families, their children, uh, their parents and grandparents? So they did cooperate and go into the camps. But the camps, as uh, I'm sure anyone who's been in them can tell you, were not like this propaganda film. And so most Americans didn't think about it. It wasn't an issue that really concerned them. They were stuck away on Indian reservations in the desert and the mountains of the West and even in the swamps of Arkansas. And for most of the war, most people didn't even think about what was going on. Plus, there was a war going on, and people had sons who were overseas fighting, and their focus was on America winning the war, while your your folks, your relatives, and and people like them were in these internment camps. Let's bring Fred into the story at this point. So how old was he when the order was given? He was 23 years old. And 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 what had he been doing up to that point? uh, He um, actually had... uh, uh, been a welder. Uh, 
he had tried to actually enlist uh, in the service um, even before the um, uh, the talk of the draft. Uh, he and his buddies wanted to kind of stay together, so they thought they would uh, apply. And first, they they uh, applied to the um, National Guard. And uh, when when they went to the post office to enlist, but the off, the military officer refused to give my father uh, an application, and that was even before you know, the, uh, before Pearl Harbor. So, uh, but my father always wanted to uh, support, you know, the, the military effort. And he decided to go to welding school and, and get his license and then was, became a, a welder uh, in, uh, in the shipyards. But uh, even then he was, um, he was, he was fired as, as uh, Pearl Harbor got closer and uh, just because he was of Japanese, you know, ancestry, even though he was an American citizen born in Oakland, California. The executive order at, at stake in this was what exactly that FDR gave? What's it's at 9066. Well, this was an executive order, uh, which was later followed up by a, an act of Congress that made violation of it a criminal offense. What the executive order did was to empower the military the West Coast military commander, General John DeWitt, to issue orders that would exclude any or all persons from designated military zones. Well, the whole West Coast was a designated military zone, all the way from the Canadian border to Mexico, uh, extending inward uh, several hundred miles, the state of Arizona, California, Oregon, Washington. Um, And so the order was open-ended, but it was only applied to Japanese Americans. And so what General DeWitt did uh, systematically, starting in, in Washington, Bainbridge Island across from Seattle, all the way down to San Diego, was issue these exclusion orders, which said that they had to report that usually within a week, and they had to report to these, uh, to these assembly centers. And as the propaganda film said, they were in racetracks and fairgrounds. Uh, the conditions were actually terrible. Mm. Um, but uh, they had no other choice. And if they resisted, they were subject to criminal penalties. And this is what motivated not only Karen's dad, but also two other Japanese Americans, Gordon Hirabayashi in Seattle, who was a student at the University of Washington, and Minoru Yasui in Portland, Oregon, who was a lawyer. They both refused to report for internment, and they violated the curfew that General DeWitt had imposed on Japanese Americans. Uh, and so they were all charged by the government, all convicted, and their cases all went to the Supreme Court. Our next video is actually Fred Korematsu about his family life uh, and this period of time in his life. Let's watch. At the nursery, my parents, they were all around the radio listening. Uh, they weren't saying very much. My mother was crying. My father was just disgusted. All that... Um, uh, work that my parents did to that nursery and so forth. What's going to happen? A few days later, the police came down there and confiscated all the flashlights and cameras. They confiscated everything that they thought that we would use for signaling. See, before the war, my parents were very proud people. They always talked about Japan, you know, and uh, also about the samurais and stuff like that. And, uh, Right after Pearl Harbor, everything just, you know, they were just real quiet. They kept it to themselves. They were afraid to talk about that. I thought the exclusion order would be only for aliens and those that were born in Japan. I didn't think that the government would go as far as to include American citizens. So, Karen Korematsu, did your grandparents go to the camps? Oh, yes. Um, Everyone of Japanese ancestry along the West Coast uh, was forced removed from their homes. But your father did not. That's correct. My 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 father was uh, the third son of, of four boys, and you know, as I said, he was 23 years old at that time. So he he was old enough to be more independent, and he learned about the Constitution in high school, uh, and thought he had uh, you know civil rights as an American citizen. So. I remember him telling me that, if, you know, at first, uh, you know, they, he thought that maybe, you know, something might happen to his parents because even though they had wanted to become citizens, they weren't. Um, but, but certainly the American citizens would be protected. 
So he, you know, once this, this order was, was issued, um, he just didn't think it was right. And, you know, all due process was, was basically, you know, thrown out the window. There were never any, any charges, never any hearings, never access to an attorney or, or, uh, uh, or your day in court. So, uh, he, you know, just wanted to get on with his life as as a as an American citizen, and 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 that's what he decided to do. He also had a personal reason. He, he, he did. had an Italian American girlfriend. Yes, right? yeah. Ta- thank you, Italian American girlfriend, not my mother, um, uh, and because uh, she said she would have never deserted him. But uh, but that was another reason. But how American is that uh, to um, you know to want to stay behind? Uh, because, you know, you, you just uh, want to stay with your girlfriend and, and just be, a, a, be an American. And that's all he ever wanted to do. How did he get arrested? Uh, he, it was on a street corner in San Leandro, California, which is a, a suburb of, uh, next to, to uh, Oakland in the San Francisco Bay Area. And he was supposed to meet his girlfriend that day on the, on the corner. And he went into this kind of uh, little corner store to buy some cigarettes and he um, he thinks he was spotted. Somebody recognized him. And so he was on the corner. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the, the San Leandro police showed up and, and said something to him like, well, have you seen any short Japanese guys around here? And my father says, no. <laughs> and, um, and then the military police came. And so that was that was it. And then they, they took him first to the San Leandro jail and uh, then the Oakland and then the federal jail in, Sa- in San Francisco. They didn't know what to do with him. So what are the important things to know about Fred Korematsu's initial steps with the law? Well, the initial steps were very uh, rudimentary, to say the least. Fred was put in, as Karen said, into the uh, federal jail. And while he was there, he was visited by uh, the director of the Northern California ACLU, a man named Ernest Bessig. And Ernie Bessig had read about Fred's, Fred's arrest in the newspaper. And he was hoping to find somebody who would uh, be willing to undertake a test case. But this was a test case that had no guarantee of success whatsoever. Um, But Fred said, okay, I will do it. Uh, There were two other Japanese Americans who'd been picked up, later sent to the camps, who were unwilling to do this. They just wanted to get this over with. But Fred said, no, I'll, I'll do this. So they held a trial. The interesting thing about the trial is that, first of all, it lasted less than one day. There was only one witness against Fred, and that was the FBI agent who interrogated him after he was arrested. There were only two questions asked at the hearing. Are you a Japanese American, which he obviously was? Secondly, did you violate the exclusion order, which he obviously did? So you're guilty. And the judge actually in that case instructed the jury that they had to find Fred guilty. Uh, And his defense attorney tried to argue constitutional issues. The judge dismissed all of them. But one interesting thing, Susan, is that when, after the judge declared that Fred was guilty, he, the sentence he imposed was probation, mm. which normally means that you're free to go about as long as you report monthly to a probation officer. But as soon as Fred had posted the bail, which was very small. Well, and Mr. Bessig was, actually wrote the check. That's right. Ernie Bessig wrote a check, $2,500 for the bail. And they were walking out of the courtroom as as a free man. There were military police standing in the doorway with guns drawn and said, we have orders to take him into custody. And Bessick said, wait a minute, you can't do that. The judge has already put him on probation. He's free to go. And they said, we're sorry, that's our orders. They took Fred away and that's the last freedom he had before he was sent to the internment camp. You're listening to C-SPAN's Landmark Cases. We will be back in a moment. When you talked to your father when, uh, in later years, as a 23-year-old, did he understand the uh, significance of his decision to go forward as a test case? I don't think he, he really knew the impact. Um, but, uh, you know, his, his decision was very simple. It wasn't complicated. You know, he thought uh, the government was wrong to incarcerate 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry. And he was, and he was right to, to take a stand. And, and he lived by his principles of, of, of right and wrong. And you know, not, not everyone can, can say that. Um, but he was this kind, very gentle person and, and just truly believed in, in, in what he was doing. 
How did other Japanese Americans who were interned react oh. to Fred standing up against this and, in fact, deciding to go forward in the courts? He, well, you know, from the time that he entered first, he went to Tanferan Racetrack, which was the detention assembly center in the San Francisco Bay Area, where, where everyone was, was um, designated first. So that was kind of the temporary quarters that were um, basically horse stalls and, uh, you know, dysentery was ran, you know, throughout the, the, uh, uh, the track and, and the food was bad. And so that's where he ended up first. And so his, once, once, um, everyone knew that he was there, um, one of his brothers in the, in the kind of the community of, uh, Japanese American men said they wanted to have a meeting, uh, to determine whether or not my father should even pursue his, uh, his, his legal case. And uh, and they and they did. They didn't really include my father uh, in, in that uh, d- uh, discussion. And so afterwards, uh, my father's uh, oldest brother, uh, Uncle High, uh, talked to my father, and my father asked, "Well, what did they say?" And they said, "Well, we don't think you should, you know, continue." And he was really, you know, vilified from day one because they thought that, you know, if if they associated with with, with my father, some some harm might come to them. Um, they thought that he thought he was just kind of too good for himself. So, uh, you know, basically we were, he was ostracized and, and as we were and, until his case was reopened in 1983. Did that remain an issue in your family over the course of lifetime? Um, no, not such a big issue. It, it just, because I didn't really even know about it until in later years. But he and his brothers, did they, did they ever have a falling out over No, this? not, not, not really. I mean, they, um, they were, you know, later on became, you know, closer again. Most people just didn't want to make waves with the government. Is that what was going on, the psychology of it all? That's right. Um, because there were no real alternatives. The, the only alternatives were to go to the camps willingly, but under duress, of course, because you had no other choice, or to go to jail. There were no other yeah. choices. And Fred took the one that was a, a very minority view, willing to, to undergo the legal process, uh, be convicted because there was no question he would be found guilty, uh, and risk going to, uh, uh, to prison for a year. They finally sent him to one of the camps. But the point is when his case went through the courts, up to the Supreme Court, um, very few people had any sympathy for not only Fred, but Japanese Americans in particular. Uh, the military, in fact, was tremendously hostile. General DeWitt, who issued the orders, uh, had said publicly things like, a Jap is a Jap. There's no such thing as a loyal Japanese. It is impossible to determine their loyalty. With the odds stacked against them like that, it's very unlikely that they would find much sympathy, even on the Supreme Court. Well, you saw the government's case, the so-called propaganda film that they made uh, to tell people what was going on with the Japanese internment. And in a few minutes, we'll show you a video of what the next stop in Fred Korematsu's saga was, which uh, was in Utah, the Topaz internment camp near Delta, Utah, and what it looks like today. But until we do that, we'd like to start taking telephone calls. We're going to begin with a call from Jordan, who's watching us in Miami. Hi, Jordan. Hi, how are you doing, esteemed panel? Greetings from sunny Miami, Florida. Thanks I just want to thank C SPAN. Uh, thank you. I want to thank C SPAN, the National Constitution Center. I just want to say that this series is very informative. I'm a brand new attorney who just passed the Florida bar, and it, the series really gives an insight to a side of the law and the side of these great Supreme Court cases that you just don't get in law school. Anyway, to my questions. Uh, my first question is where does this case rank? as, like, one of the worst in the court's history up there with the Dred Scott decision. And what really disturbs me is, can this really happen again, this blatant violation of due process and our constitutional rights as Americans? Thank you. Well, those are really good questions, Jordan. Um, And I will quote, uh, and I normally don't, but I will quote uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, I don't often agree with his opinions, but Justice Scalia said... Korematsu ranks with Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson as the three worst decisions ever in the Supreme Court. And the question of whether this can happen again, 
Unfortunately, the court has not ever overturned or had the occasion to overturn the Korematsu decision. So technically, it stays on the books. And as I quoted Justice uh, Jackson as saying earlier, it lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority with a plausible reason. Well, we may say, of course, this isn't going to happen again. We're a much more decent, tolerant society today. Uh, but to think that history can never repeat itself is, is, is really... Uh, not something we should do. Karen Korematsu, on Twitter, John Young wants to know, how did the authorities differentiate those of Japanese descent from people with, uh, from other Asian countries, i.e. China? Well, that's a, a very good question. Uh, if uh, at the time the, the Chinese um, developed these little buttons, that, like lapel buttons uh, that they wore, and, they, um, and it said, I am Chinese, so that it, you know they wouldn't be confused with the with the with the Japanese and Japanese Americans. Um, I mean, certainly you know they uh, everyone kind of lived in their own communities at the time, so it was very easy to um, you know to to kind of figure out where everyone was. I mean, the government actually you know had had really been what we call racial profiling these people, you know, years before. I mean, how how in the world did they end up rounding up? At least two thousand people the day after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. If they didn't, you know, if, if they hadn't done that, that kind of research, the same thing as they did after nine eleven. So, uh, you know, the communities already had been um, had been targeted, and um, and of course, you know, last names and IDs were also a big difference. You know, ja Japanese names are multi-syllable, and, and Chinese and Koreans aren't. Jim is watching us in Caliente, California. Hi, Jim. You're on. Hi there. Thank you. Um, and I'm a retired attorney, so I, so I go with the new attorney. But <laughs> and I agree with him as to the um, the horror of this case. How what a bad case it is. But my question is, how do we? How can a court, any court, any judicial system, set up safeguards so if that executive order like this comes down again? Um, it, it isn't, and the court makes a ruling and overturns Karamatsu. It's still, at the end, not going to mean anything because the executive uh, department, the, the executive branch, and the, and, the, and the military will do exactly what they're told to do. Thank you. Well, that's a that's a really good question because uh, it goes back to the issue that came up before the Supreme Court in Korematsu in 1944. What are the limits of the government's powers under the Constitution? particularly the executive branch, to issue orders that are uh, in exercise of the president's power to direct national security and foreign policy. And the courts have been very reluctant to uh, intrude upon that power. And that's why they have what's called judicial deference. If the, military, if the president makes an order and says this is in support of my powers under the Constitution, uh, the courts are very reluctant to say, well, you've gone too far. Now, on this series, you're going to hear a case in which the Supreme Court said, yes, the president did go too far when he seized the steel companies during the Korean War. But during World War II, um, there, there was no real check. The only check was the, was the conscience and the judgment and the uh, character of the members of the Supreme Court. They were the only people who could have put a stop to this. Next is Steve watching us in, is it Hawkinson, Delaware? Uh, Hocassin, Delaware. Hocassin. I Hocassin. Used to live there. You used to live yeah. in Hocassin, Delaware? Right near. How about that? Yes. Well, welcome to the program, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. There's a pretty big Asian uh, Chinese uh, uh, population here. Uh, uh, real quick, uh, I would say Corey Matsu is the bravest Asian American I can think of. And second is that uh, pretty much the uh, same that uh, like people said already, uh, due to the unlimited power of government during wartime, Korea Marshall in the U.S. It really had an implication on U.S. versus uh, Edward Snowden, because uh, right now we have unlimited power during wartime. Because uh, I think the absence of judicial review of uh, this power in Korea Marshall in the U.S.A., he was a very confusing uh, president uh, for during the Vietnam War and the war on drugs and war on terror and cyber warfare and drone warfare. So as long as you put the word war 
the government has all the power they can have. Uh, but the last, the, the third thing is the, really the most curious thing I want to ask the panel. Nobody has ever, any attorneys representing Korematsu, has ever mentioned the deprivation of property rights of 100,000 Japanese Americans. There is a term called the imminent domain. This is what the British uh, did to the Americans before the independence war. During a wartime, the citizens have property rights. You vacate the entire West Coast, separating Japanese property owners of their property. What's the reparation for that? Is there any, like, is it because uh, the government doesn't want to go back to the reparation of slavery, so they don't want to revisit this uh, Korematsu of the USA? Thank you very much, Steve. Well, let me do that in reverse order. So we saw in the video that people had bank accounts taken away, businesses were closed. Were those uh, assets taken permanently or were were they returned to them after the internment was over? Well, for the for the most part, people just lost everything. I mean, they yeah, they they I mean, some may have had um, some monies returned to them, but that was a very small percentage. Um, most of the uh, Japanese uh, farmers, you know, they were just renting the land. Now there were some nice, there were good ca- uh, cases where the Caucasian um, uh, neighbor maybe uh, farmed the land for the Jap- Japanese American who was incarcerated. Um, and then when they came back, they got back the land. But that was not the majority. Um, you know, fortunately, my grandfather was able to buy land in, in East Oakland uh, uh, in a commercial zoned area before the alien land law took into effect on August 10th, 1913. So when before they were forced removed from their home, he went to the bank and there was an immigrant a Portuguese banker there who who took care of trying to at least rent the, the, the land. I mean, when they came back, it was in rack and ruin. Uh, the greenhouses and the glass was all broken down. The house had been, you know, had van- been vandalized. Um, the plants were, were stolen. But most people just lost everything because they were just renting, um, and they had to leave everything behind. I mean, that's, that, the, the important part of this also to, to point out is that, you know, it, even though there was rep- reparations, you know, later, redress and reparations later on, it didn't compensate for, for what was, was lost because you could only carry in two hands what you could take with you. Um, that was about 50 pounds each. You either had to try to sell it like in a fire sale for 10 cents on the dollar or give it to a friend hoping that they may take care of your possessions. But in a lot of cases, they didn't, the neighbors didn't think uh, people were coming back. So they would get rid of the property, the, you know, the possessions, sell them, use them, or whatever. And so it it, it was it was a, a terrible um, you know condition in, of of validation of, of human rights. I don't want to use up too much time on this because it's going to evaporate quickly. But on the caller's first concerns about precedence in uh, war powers today, and referencing Edward Snowden, for example. Well, they're not exactly comparable. Um, because the the government does have the power actually to uh, to prosecute people, pass laws making it criminal, uh, to actually harm the United States in any way during wartime or even during peacetime. Um, but the point is that the Japanese Americans had done nothing that was criminal, except Fred's resistance to the internment, and so th- there was no crime they were accused of. The whole premise of Roosevelt's executive order was protection of the West Coast against espionage and sabotage. During the entire war, there was not a single case of espionage or sabotage by any Japanese American. And you could say, well, that's because they were all locked up in the, in the internment camps. Well, the point is that during the time before that happened, the Army, the Navy, the Federal Communications Commission, government agencies were looking, and the FBI were looking everywhere they could for evidence that people were signaling to the Japanese trying to communicate with them. They found nothing. All told, how many years was your family interned? Uh, Over at least two and a half years. We're we're going to show next the video from the Camp Topaz, which, as I mentioned, is in Delta, Utah. We'll see what it looks like today, and you'll get a real sense of what people faced when they got off those buses and saw what their life was going to be like.
Fred Korematsu and his family would have arrived here um, in September of 1942, and this is what they would have seen. Fred Kormatsu's family would have arrived in Delta uh, by train from Tanferan, and uh, they would have been either bussed or trucked out here. Uh, here would be the administrative area, and then back in there would have been um, over 600 barracks um, all lined up. So there were about 250 people in each block, um, six barracks on one side, six barracks on this side. Barrack 9 would have been about right in here, and that's where the Korematsu family lived. This is a recreation of one of the barracks at Topaz. The, the barracks were 20 feet wide and 120 feet long, and they were divided into six different uh, rooms. This particular room that we have recreated here is 20 feet by 20 feet. Um, oddly, uh, this is exactly the same size room as Fred Korematsu's family would have lived in. These are cots that came from Topaz. Everyone was given a mattress, um, just a cotton mattress with two army blankets. So these would have been the kind of mattresses and, and cots that the Korematsu slept on. When people came from Tanferan, um, many of the rooms weren't finished. Uh, they didn't have sheetrock, they didn't have ceilings, they didn't have the masonite on the floor. It would have been freezing, uh, even in the daytime. The only um, heating they would have had would have been a pot-bellied stove, but this this would not have been able to heat the entire room in a comfortable kind of way. In the winter, it was freezing cold here, but in the, um, the summer, because the outside of the barracks were covered with black tar paper, it would have absorbed the heat and it would have been stifling. What was daily life like for people? What did they do to occupy their time? What did the government provide? Uh, you said they only had 50 pounds worth of their own belongings. Uh, so how did they pass the time? Well, the, the Japanese Americans were very resourceful. Um, they, you know, for the most part, they said, you know, we have to get on with their lives. So they, you know, the, the parents wanted, um, uh, you know, schooling for their children. So they had to kind of make, have these makeshift uh, classrooms in these barracks um, and, and sometimes we, they were able to bring in some teachers. Um, I, I even remember uh, George Takei, who, who now has his opening um, Broadway show, Allegiance, uh, in New York, you know, said he, he remembers like looking out, you know, the window of this, of this, where his classroom was, of this barrack, and just looking at desolate land. Um, you know, it, 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 there was baseball, finally, there were some baseball teams, um, people finally had some music, and so they, they either had instruments sent in, um, they had some dance bands, created bands. There was even Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts uh, troops there. So, uh, you know, had their churches. So they tried to, to slowly but surely make the best of, of, a, of a terrible, horrible um, situation. So we have another video to show you just to get a sense of this. And this is a very rare piece of video. It's a home movie made by a, another internee whose name is Dave Tatsuno. He was also in the Topaz camp. He snuck a camera in and recorded some of the scenes of what life was like for people there. And later on, he made a documentary film about the experience. Let's watch. This is a shot of the evacuees doing a volunteer work of repairing the pipes uh, which broke. They had used such uh, poor material that the pipes used to break. And we had a volunteer work crew repair the pipes. And here we have the dust storm. This was taken on a warm Sunday afternoon and everyone had to keep their windows closed, shut tight. And it was very hot, no air conditioning, and the wind blew and the dust blew and the dust would come inside the cracks and the windows and the doors. And it blew and blew. And you stay cooped up inside your barrack. And then my brother, Tut, came into camp to visit us. And the sad part is that Wearing his Army, U.S. Army uniform, he had to come through U.S. Army guards to come to visit his family. 
Peter Ernst, can you pick up on that last point? There were probably other men uh, interned in the camp of uh, military age. Uh, how did the government treat them if they were interested in serving in the war? Well, it was a very complicated situation because initially the military resisted, particularly the Army resisted, uh, any involvement of Japanese Americans as soldiers. But they finally decided, mostly as a public relations gesture, that they would um, set up a separate battalion, the 442nd Battalion it was called, uh, composed of Japanese Americans, most of whom came out of the camps, the volunteered, um, to serve their country uh, fighting against an enemy that used concentration camps uh, while their own parents were in camps. Uh, this so became. They were, they were sent to the European. They were sent theater. to the European and theater. They Pacific fought theater. very valiantly, particularly in Italy, um, and they suffered the greatest casualties of any battalion, and they were the most decorated. Uh, one U.S. senator, uh, the late uh, uh, Senator Inouye, Dan Inouye from Hawaii, was a member of the 442nd. He lost an arm during the war, uh, so they fought valiantly. But there were other uh, internees in camp, young men who resisted the draft. This is a little-known, little-told story. And they said, as, as long as we're being locked up simply because of our race, why should we fight for a country that treats us like this? And they refused to go. They were known as the re resistors. Uh, many of them were convicted, sent to prison. Uh, finally, President Truman, after the war, uh, pardoned them all. But it was, it was sort of a mixed thing because the, the Army treated them as a special, as they also did with uh, African-American soldiers during the war. It was a segregated army. Uh, they fought for their country, they suffered and died for their country, but they were not treated as real Americans. In fact, there were a series of questions asked, loyalty questions of people interned in the camps. Here's a sample of two related to service. Question 27 in this loyalty form, are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? And question 28, will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any or all attack by foreign or domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any foreign government power organization? And those who answered no, no, became the no-nos. Uh, and uh, that's the story that you were telling that later on that they were forgiven for that. Uh, I want to take a couple more calls, and then the next stage is this case moving to the Supreme Court. We'll find out how that happened. But let's listen to Martha, who is watching us in Martinsville, Virginia. You're on the air. Hi, Martha. Hey. Um, I just wanted, I'm probably, probably the question's been answered or it's going to be answered, but I just remember, I'm 68 years old, but I can remember when my mother was, when I was eight years old, she told me all about this and was outraged by it even then. This was in the early 50s, and she had just been a teenager, but she was still outraged at the way the Japanese were treated. And we're from Virginia, who not known as a real liberal state, but, <laughs> but she was outraged by it. And what I wanted to know was how the dissenters on the Supreme Court decision how did they make their judgment? What was their reason for dissenting against the majority? Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking that. We haven't gotten to that yet. And if you don't mind, we'll hold the question until we do. Uh, let's take a call next from Marvin, who is in Los Angeles. Marvin, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, I'm a retired high school U.S. history teacher. And the introduction to your program uses Justice Breyer saying he's talking about the rule of law. I don't understand how the violation of the Fifth Amendment, Section 9, uh, Bill of Attainder, and Article 4, uh, in, um, the right of a trial by jury, could be ignored by somebody like Justice Douglas. That's the first part. The second thing I wanted to say is, I wonder if you know that at one time in the early administration of President Obama, a Japanese-American was three persons away from being president of the United States. Senator Inouye was the, was the president pro tem of the United States Senate. And the first person would be the vice president, the second person would be the Speaker of the House, and the third person in line to be president of the United States 
would be a Japanese American whose friends were put into places like Manzanar and many others. Thank you very much for the program. You're topping even the First Ladies, and that's <laughs> quite a task. Well, thank, thank you. you so much, Marvin. So what is your reaction to Marvin's comments there about the way history came full circle in this case? Well, it's, it's a very interesting um, comment because the, the, uh, the idea that when something terrible happens in a country, particularly ours, where we take our rights very seriously, um, that once we have advanced past that uh, and we have come to understand, the same thing happened with school segregation, for example. We got past school segregation, but in a sense, we never left it behind mm. because to, to get ahead of things, uh, our schools are still segregated uh, in many places. And the idea that things like this can't happen again. Marvin talked about the rule of law. Uh, members of the Supreme Court, of course, and, and all public officials in this country take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution has these particular guarantees. He mentioned the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, uh, the right to trial by jury. You can't be sentenced to incarceration without a trial, without charges being brought against you. All of this was ignored, glossed over by the Supreme Court in the Korematsu case. Next up is William in Denver, Colorado. Hi, William. You're on. Oh, thank you very much. Um, mine is more of a personal. I was uh, aware very much that Minoru Yasui, one of the three leaders that uh, were mentioned early on, became a very distinguished civic leader in Denver, and I was greatly honored many years ago to receive a, a civic award that was dedicated to Monaro. Um, at the same time, I should say that it is true that the uh, post-9-11 uh, uh, actions by the Congress, um, the Patriot Act, etc., remind us that this could happen over and over again, and that we do have to uh, be forever vigilant. But also, as you just were mentioning, how important it is that the hope triumphs in the end, People, uh, uh, people were displaced, but they didn't lose faith. They came back, and uh, the country is stronger, perhaps, for the experience. Thank you. William, thanks for the comments. So next we are going to show you that there was widespread debate in the FDR administration on the constitutionality of the Japanese internment program. A Justice Department document acknowledging that the government knew about the, the Japanese Americans posing no security threat would form the basis for Fred Korematsu's case later on in his life. Let's watch. This is a group of documents that we've pulled from the FDR library archives that uh, gives you an indication of the discussion and debate that went on uh, over this question about whether or not to intern Japanese Americans on the west coast of the United States. This one's very interesting. It's from the uh, assistant to the uh, Attorney General of the United States, from James Rowe to FDR, or actually to FDR secretary, asking uh, her to, to kind of alert the president to the situation that's going on in California. He says it looks like it might explode any day now. There's a huge amount of public pressure to, to quote, move them out of California, citizens and aliens alike. He also says here it would probably require a suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, and, in, and my estimate of the country's present feeling is that we should have another Supreme Court fight on our hands. So he's clearly concerned about the legal implications and the constitutionality of trying to intern uh, Japanese Americans. Here's a document that's uh, coming from the Attorney General of the United States, Francis Biddle, to, uh, to FDR. First of all, he identifies in the opening paragraph that there clearly is a racist element involved in this discussion of trying to intern Japanese Americans during the war. Uh, he says that West Coast people distrust the Japanese, various special interest groups would welcome their removal from good farmland and the elimination of competition. But he says, uh, in spite of that, my last advice from the War Department is, is that there is no evidence of imminent attack uh, and from the FDI that there is no evidence of planned sabotage. So he's dismissing uh, the fundamental arguments in favor of interning Japanese Americans. 
Here actually is the actual uh, text of the executive order. So this document is actually uh, not all that specific in terms of which nationalities or ethnic groups might be uh, ultimately affected by it. What it does is to define this idea that the Department of War has the authority to, to create these military exclusion zones. And of course, these would be fairly large areas on the west coast of the United States. And as a result of this, under this authority, uh, the Japanese-American community on the West Coast, including American citizens, uh, would be moved into uh, internment camps. So, Peter Irons, we see that there were people within the Roosevelt administration who predicted that there would be a court challenge. How, in fact, did Fred Korematsu's case get to the Supreme Court? What was the mechanism? Well, uh, after Fred was convicted, uh, there was an appeal. The appeal went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which didn't decide the case. It just sent it on to the Supreme Mm -hmm. Court. And the court had already decided in 1943 the cases of Gordon Hirabayashi and Min Yasui, uh, but those involved the curfew. And the curfew was considered much less of a burden on Japanese Americans. After all, it only said you had to be in your homes between 8 p.m. and and 5 a.m. But the internment itself, the exclusion order, was uh, the issue before the court. And it, it's very clear now, in hindsight, that the court was misled. But the point, I think, that's even more important is that it was clear at the time there were government officials, including Attorney General Biddle, several of the Justice Department lawyers who were involved in these cases, who said, no, we can't do this. It violates the Constitution. And in what became, I think, one of the great uh, tragedies of American law, the government's highest-ranking lawyer, the Solicitor General of the United States, got up before the Supreme Court and said, this is something we have to do because the President and the Congress have decided on this. We are not going to challenge them. We are not going to second-guess them. There are Americans lying at the bottom of Pearl Harbor who were killed by the Japanese, and we have to be vigilant about this. So in our last week's case, which was a World War I case, we learned that the justices were really imbued with lots of patriotism during the time of the war in World War I. Was it not the same sort of feeling that these justices wanted to support the war effort? It, it was, almost exactly. But in contrast to the decision in Gordon Hirabayashi's case, which was unanimous, um, the decision in Fred's case was a split decision, as you said, six to three. Um, But what's very interesting is that some of the most liberal justices on the court, by reputation and historical account, uh, Justice Hugo Black, for example, who wrote the opinion upholding uh, Fred Korematsu's conviction, Justice Harlan Fisk Stone, Justice William O. Douglas, Felix Frankfurter, considered the great liberals on the court, voted to uphold his conviction. There were three justices, however, who dissented, and every constitutional scholar agrees that these dissents by these three justices completely eviscerated, Mm. obliterated the reasoning in Justice Black's opinion. And they pointed out, made two serious points. First of all, abject deference to the executive, even during wartime, is not the function of the judiciary. It's upholding the Constitution. And secondly, that this was decided simply on the basis of race. They made that point, as Justice Murphy said, I dissent from this legalization of racism. And very soon after these decisions, within a year, one of the most noted law professors in the country, uh, Professor Eugene Rostow of Yale Law School, wrote an article in the Yale Law Journal making this point. He said the Korematsu case is a constitutional disaster. So this is not something that 40, 50, 60, 70 years later we're saying, oh, that was a mistake back then, but they had their reasons for it. They had no reason at the time except to uphold what they thought was a patriotic duty. So for the record, I want to get some of this on the screen so people uh, can have the reference. Uh, First of all, the chief justice at the time was... Harlan Fiskstone. Harlan yeah. Fiskstone. And uh, he was appointed by whom? What was his particular persuasion? Well, he actually, he was appointed by Herbert Hoover. Mm. Um, he was a Republican, but he was, um, a, he wouldn't be a Republican today uh, because he, he was, in fact, uh, one of the great chief justices 
we've had. And there were also a number of other names that have become famous to people who don't even know much about the court. You mentioned Justice William O. Douglas, Felix Frankfurter, uh, also uh, Frank Murphy, Robert Jackson. So overall, the constitution of this court was what at this time? Well, eight of the court, with the exception of of, uh, the seven of the nine members, with the exception of Justice Jackson and Justice Stone, uh, had been appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. They were the New Deal justices. When Roosevelt threatened to pack the court back in the 1930s by adding new justices, um, he finally got his wish, and he appointed a a majority of the court. So these were people who owed some kind of personal and institutional loyalty to the president. It's not that they were always going to vote for his policies or to uphold the laws that he supported. But in this particular case, during wartime, It is very hard for anybody, including a member of the Supreme Court, to stand up and say the president is wrong, the president has violated the Constitution, and what would be the implications of that? So the specific questions before the court were two. First of all, does Congress and the executive have the power to exclude persons of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast near military installations in wartime? And the court said yes. And the question, second question, should Fred Korematsu's conviction be upheld? And the court said yes. And that was a six to three decision. I want to read a little bit of Justice Hugo Black's opinion to you so you get the flavor of it. Now, first of all, you note in your book that it started out with a ringing uh, decrying of racism. Uh, So how did it switch philosophically? Well, it switched because, um, like many people, uh, Supreme Court justices included, Um, You can believe in one thing and believe in the exact opposite at the same time to make an argument. Justice uh, Black did say that racism is wrong. This was not done. As he said, Fred Korematsu was not convicted because of hostility to him or his race. All right. Let me read the rest of that, because that's where we started and what we we chose from his opinion. Korematsu was not excluded from the military area because of hostility to him or his race. He was excluded because we are at war with the Japanese empire. Military authorities decided that the urgency of the situation demanded that all citizens of Japanese ancestry be segregated from the West Coast temporarily. Congress, reposing its confidence in this time of war in our military leaders, as it inevitably must, determined that they should have the power to do just this. So what's notable about that? Well, what's notable about that is that uh, uh, there are several aspects to that that are very questionable. Uh, First is that the judiciary has no real role in reviewing presidential or executive decisions during wartime, and that's flatly wrong. The judiciary, in fact, uh, has done that in the past, even during the Civil War, where the judiciary said that President Lincoln could not suspend the writ of habeas corpus and could not intern people indefinitely or even sentence them to death without a trial in the civilian courts. So that aspect of it was wrong. And secondly, the the suggestion, is, as both you and I quoted (coughs) Justice Black as saying, that Fred Korematsu was not... Uh, convicted because of hostility to him or his race, was flatly wrong. And that's what the dissenters pointed out, particularly Justice Murphy, that who pointed out that this whole thing was based on uh, racial assumptions. And as I had quoted General DeWitt earlier as, as saying, there's no such thing as a loyal Japanese. No such thing. The military had argued that the reason for the internment was that they didn't have time to sort out the loyal from the disloyal or as General DeWitt put it, the goats from the sheep. He said it was impossible to do this, and they accepted that. So here's a bit from Justice Jackson's dissent, one of three dissenting in the case. Guilt is personable and not inheritable. Even if all of one's antecedents had been convicted of treason, the Constitution forbids its penalties to be visited upon him. But here is an attempt to make an otherwise innocent act a crime merely because this prisoner is the son of parents as to whom he had no choice and belongs to a race from which there is no way to resign. If Congress in peacetime legislation should enact such a criminal law, I should suppose this court would refuse to enforce it. I think that's a powerful statement. I think that the dissents in this case, um, like the dissents in many famous cases, for example, the dissents of Justice Holmes and Brandeis and Abrams versus the United States during World War I. On your last program, 
those dissents are now the accepted uh, version of what the Constitution means. And the majority opinions have gone down. The only problem is, in Fred's case, that that decision still remains on the book because the president has, uh, the Supreme Court has never revisited the case or said flatly, we were wrong. That's why these lessons need to be learned. The case was decided in December of 1944. Yes. When did the camps close? Well, they, they closed at various times. Um, so by, by 1945, you know, most of them were all closed. Um, and, and people actually left in, at, in, at different stages. So, you know, the, the thing is that the, 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 um, the evidence was already there, even the day one that everyone started going in, into these concentration camps, that there was no military necessity. Um, these were not dangerous people. So, you know, at, at some point the, the government was, was um, saying, well, what are we going to do with 120,000 people when they all are going to, to leave the camps? So the... Um, the community leaders, they got community leaders to go in and help uh, people get uh, jobs. You could go east before the end of the war, but you couldn't go west. And that's what my father did, uh, which was surprising to me to learn since he already had a, a federal conviction. So let's take some more calls. Gladys in Pittsburgh, you're on the air. Hi, Gladys. Oh, good evening. I just want to uh, ask the uh, panelists <laughs> if they did not think this was completely racist happened to the Japanese. Germany's, Germans were not interned. Germany was not bombed. Italy, Italians were not interned. Italy was not bombed. All of the Japanese were bombed and interned. And that's also because of the color of their skin. Thank you. Well, we certainly did bomb Germany. Yes. And certainly not yes. using the atomic bomb, but we certainly yes. did bomb Germany to that point. But she does make the case about internment. Yes. Well, it was clearly racist. Uh, and and, and and actually, you know that 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 lesson is 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 relevant today. I mean, we you know the the Kormatsu versus the United States. My father's case was about racial prejudice, uh, clearly, and uh, and and those lessons you know need to be to be learned, uh, and that's what brings the, the relevancy you know to it, especially you know like the situation after nine eleven. My father was one of the very first people to speak up. Uh, along with the Japanese American Citizens League, when they talked about rounding up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them again in co- American concentration camps. Celestina Radogano asks, if FDR's court packing had gone through, do you think Korematsu would have been decided differently? Well, Roosevelt's court packing actually did go through because the conservative justices that he wanted to replace actually left the court. They died or retired. And so he replaced them with his own choices. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, what we're indicting here, and I think it really is an indictment of the court, um, is the assumption that uh, if these are good liberal civil liberties, civil rights uh, supporters, how could they do something like this? And I think that there, there are two points to consider here. One, as I pointed out earlier, is that they were motivated largely by patriotism, uh, that it that it was not their function to tell the president during time of war that he couldn't take these kinds of steps. And secondly, that they were misled. They were lied to by the government. The Supreme Court was lied to during these cases, particularly in Fred's case. And that was the, uh, the impetus for, during the 1980s, reopening Fred's case, bringing it back to the federal courts, so that he could have the trial that he, that he never had in the first place. So a DJ uh, on uh, Twitter asks, hard to believe that one of the greatest Supreme Court justices of all time, Hugo Black, authored the majority opinion in Korematsu. Well, there are a number of reasons uh, why it would sound surprising, because Black was generally a supporter of civil liberties Mm -hmm. and and racial equality. Um, But in this case, he had a personal connection. He was a good friend and, in fact, had lived for a time uh, with General DeWitt. He was also a veteran of World War I and intensely patriotic about that. And so, in a, in a sense, he was blinded by those dual loyalties. His loyalty to the president, who had put him on the court. Uh, his loyalty to the military, and General DeWitt in particular. So that when the arguments were made uh, that, that Fred's conviction violated the Constitution, in a sense, he changed gears. That is, 
He stopped being the person that he usually was. This is true of other people on the court as well. But in Black's case, it was, it was really a sad thing because he could have. And the initial vote on Fred's case in the court was five to four. Justice Douglas switched his vote at the last minute. Mm. So, so if they had stayed true to their principles and not been swayed by these wartime pressures, we probably would not be here. We would not be talking about Fred's case because it would have been reversed. His conviction would have been vacated and the internment would have been seen for what it was, which was a purely racist act of power. David is in Brentwood, Tennessee. Hi, David. Hello. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I've never really liked alarmists or uh, doomsdayers, but uh, mm. looking forward, I wonder um, in the unlikely event that nuclear bombs go off in our land, uh, <laughs> what do you think, in your expert opinion, the likelihood would be that it would actually be a roundup of Muslims or a religious class. Thank you. Well, this was actually proposed after 9-11. And, uh, for, and there were thousands of uh, Arab and Muslim Americans rounded up, uh, some of them detained for lengthy periods of time. There are still lawsuits going on challenging that. Uh, so the idea that it couldn't happen again uh, is sort of wishful thinking. Um, I would like to believe that we learn from our mistakes. And it's, it's encouraging to think that today's generation, particularly young people, have more of an appreciation for uh, the rights they enjoy as Americans. But there are enormous pressures, particularly during times of war. As one of the judges pointed out, the judge who vacated Fred's conviction in 1983 pointed out, during time of national crisis, or wartime, we have to be especially vigilant to protect our constitutional rights. I want to show another piece of video. When last we left Fred Korematsu's story, his conviction had been upheld by the Supreme Court. He eventually got out of the camp and traveled to the Midwest of the United States. This piece of video is from 1998, January 15th, and this takes place at the White House. Let's watch. In the long history of our country's constant search for justice, some names of ordinary citizens stand for millions of souls. Plessy, Brown, Parks. To that distinguished list, today we add the name of Fred Korematsu. Karen Korematsu, what was the path that happened to your father from his Supreme Court upholding his conviction to the president of the United States 40 years later, giving him the Medal of Freedom? Uh, so how did that all proceed? Tell us the story. Well, he, he was able to leave uh, the Topaz uh, concentration camp uh, to, to uh, pursue a, jo a job opportunity. Uh, he was uh, found for New York or someone brought to him. And uh, first, actually, he went to Salt Lake City, and he almost died there of pneumonia, uh, and then went on to Detroit, Michigan, because his youngest brother was there. And, uh, and so that's um, when he uh, met and married my, my mother. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they couldn't get married in, in uh, South Carolina, where she was from, uh, but they got married in Detroit, Michigan. Because the laws were against the that interracial were, yes, marriage. Yes, yes. Yes. So what about the legal side of the case? How did that pursue, and you had a role to play in this, Peter Iron. So what happened? Well, this is one of the, the great uh, experiences you never anticipate. Uh, back in 1981, uh, I decided to write a book about these cases, sort of an academic book, really. Uh, you have a, uh, a copy of it. It's called Justice at War. Uh, and in the course of the research for that book, because I'd learned about these cases in law school, uh, in my constitutional law class, and we'd read them, and everybody agreed these were terrible cases, terrible decisions. My question was, how could this happen with all these liberal justices to make such a terrible mistake? So I started researching it, and in the course of that research, I came up with documents uh, 
in the government's own files, the Justice Department's own files, that showed that during the prosecution of these cases before the Supreme Court, Justice Department lawyers had warned the Solicitor General of the United States, Charles Fahey, that the evidence he was planning to present, that there was in fact uh, evidence of espionage and sabotage, was absolutely false. The FBI had, had investigated this and found no evidence to support it. The Federal Communications Commission, the Navy Intelligence Service, they had all agreed there was no evidence to support this. And he asked the Solicitor General, in fact, he almost demanded, he said, it is highly unfair to this racial minority that these lies put out in an official publication go uncorrected. And the Solicitor General in 1944 had stood up before the Supreme Court and said he stood behind every word, every line, and every syllable of the military's report claiming that there had been acts of espionage and sabotage. So walk us through the dates pretty quickly here because our time is going to run out. Okay. So what well, happened? Very, very quickly, we found these documents, me and other researchers, and put together legal teams in San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle where the three cases started and filed suits in federal court under a provision called quorum nobis, which means that you can go back to court even after you serve your sentence uh, if you have evidence that the government has committed misconduct. We went back to court, and in all three of those cases, the judges agreed that the government had lied to the Supreme Court, and so they vacated them. And the decision in Fred Korematsu's case was a very powerful symbol of the fact that we can correct our mistakes. Now, staying with the, the story, uh, also there was a commission created to look into the whole internment process, and uh, that commission decided to do what? Well, they they wanted to... Uh, to uh, this is during the Reagan administration. Re oh, yes. So they, the redress and reparations movement started uh, 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 just before um, my father's case was reopened. So, you know, through the, 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 uh, the War Relocation Authority, uh, they were reviewing how the Japanese and Japanese Americans were treated uh, during the incarceration. And uh, so when my father's, when people the, in the community got wind that, you know, my father was going to reopen his case, um, th there were people that were not in favor of that because uh, they thought that if my father lost, you know, Korematsu versus the United States, that that would hurt their chances. Um, but, uh, but my father, you know, as he's done before, uh, said, you know, he, he, wanted to, he wanted to go on with this. And, and people... You know, took risks. I mean, you know, the the uh, Quorum Nobis legal team took a risk of, of losing Korematsu versus the United States all over again, and uh, and so. But my father was determined um, to to go along with this. And so ultimately, the commission uh, found that the Japanese who were interned were due reparations. So, how much money did people get, and how was that done? Well, Congress. It was as many things are a compromise. Uh, there was an official apology uh, issued by President Reagan, um, uh, who initially opposed right. redress and reparations. But it, it's very interesting because uh, he was his mind was changed by some very conservative members of Congress, including uh, uh, leading Republicans, who said um, this is something that is important and needs to be done. And Congress also voted that each surviving internee, about 60,000 out of the 120,000 who'd been in the camps, would get a check for $20,000. Now, some people may say, well, th you know, that's the government giving money away. We didn't do it. It was done years and years ago. Why should we pay them reparations for this? And I always ask people when they bring this up, if you were put in a concentration camp without charges, living in a desert, for three years, how much would you do that for? How much money would it take to make you do that? Nobody would ever do that for twenty thousand dollars. All right, and it wasn't, and the, and the money wasn't the important um, issue. It was the apology, you know, because all these Japanese Americans, you know, just here they had 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 done what the government wanted them to do to prove that they were good Americans, and they carried that weight on their shoulders of of of, of shame all those years. So that was that was more important than the money. But sometimes you don't 
you don't get the government's attention unless you talk about money. And so your father continued his advocacy till yes. the end of his life, filed amicus briefs, friends of the court briefs in cases that were relevant, including the Jose Padilla case. Yes. Um, and uh, the, the Fred Korematsu Institute was formed. What do you do there? Uh, well, we do uh, civil and human rights education uh, starting from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Uh, we have uh, teaching kits that uh, we provide for teachers for free so they can go online to korematsuinstitute.org. And we have middle, uh, elementary, middle school, and high school uh, lesson plans. Uh, and, uh, and we're also um, working on Fred Korematsu Day. Uh, the state of California, um, thanks to Assemblymember Warren Fruitani uh, and, and then Assemblymember Marty Brock Block, um, uh, issued a uh, legislative bill that uh, Governor uh, Schwarzenegger signed in 2010, um, establishing Fred Korematsu Day for the state of California in perpetuity on my father's birthday of January 30th. So do you get involved in legal advocacy still, or is this mostly yes, educational? Well, I, I do, I mean, more on a personal side, um, especially on, on issues that, um, of civil rights, uh, when uh, I'm asked to support um, in, in um, amicus briefs. Um, certainly, um, uh, th I do that as, as well. So we have about 10 minutes left, and we've, we've weaved this through, all the way through, about the implications for today. But let's finish on that note. I want to play a clip uh, from Justice Breyer, and uh, he is talking about the court's reasoning in Korematsu and compares it to decisions in Guantanamo, Guantanamo being very much in the news this very week as we're doing this program. Let's listen to Justice Breyer. They thought that, well, we can't get involved in this. It's the military trying to protect us from invasion. Now, we run the war or Roosevelt runs it. And we can't run it. So we have to let Roosevelt do what he wants. Now, to go back to your Guantanamo question, what I think is the, the very, very difficult and very important question in this area is, is there a middle way? Is there a role for the court to protect basic individual human rights guaranteed in the Constitution in time of war without turning the Constitution into a suicide pact, because it's not a suicide pact. And the President and the Congress have to have, and they do have in that document, adequate power to protect the country. So when these two things conflict, does the court just get out of the way and say, no, it's somebody else's job? Or does the court make some effort to reconcile these two competing and opposite necessities? In Guantanamo, they tried the latter. And I want, I want the public who reads it, I want people to understand what it is the court did. And I say there, which I firmly believe, it won't be for, for perhaps many years before people will know whether the court was right or wrong. And what did the court do? What it did, basically, is in each of those cases, they decided in favor of the Guantanamo prisoner. So there's two threads of legal legacy of this case. One, as Karen Korematsu reminds us, is about racial-based uh, law, and the other is on this detention and war powers. So I want to put a few citations of the Korematsu case on screen, and they are both camps. First of all, uh, Harper versus Virginia Board of Elections, uh, which was a 1966 case based on race. Loving versus Virginia, which is on interracial marriage, 1967 also under, came as a, the, the racial legal legacy. And University of California Regents versus Bakke in 1978, also on affirmative action policies in school. Uh, but then we've got another one, which it was cited in, which is Hamdi v. Rumsfeld, 2004. Mm -hmm. And it was the dissent that you referenced. So when we look at this case and how it has woven its way through the fabric of American jurisprudence, what should we learn? Well, I think what we learn is is that uh, decisions that were made uh, many years ago were under conditions that are very different than they are now. Um, what Justice Breyer pointed out, and I think quite rightly, is that we cannot classify citizens anymore, or even any person for that matter, uh, simply on the basis of their race or ethnicity. That is forbidden by the Constitution, the Due Process Clause and the Equal Protection Clause. What we can do is individualized uh, and targeted 
um, protection of the country against specific threats and dangers. For example, if someone, if there is a credible threat that a particular person or even a member of a particular group is planning or about to carry out harm to the United States, and this, of course, is very much in the news now with airplane bombings, the government has the power to uh, detain that person for a reasonable period, and if they have evidence that they have committed a crime, a federal crime, they can bring them into court, and they will have a lawyer, they will have a hearing, they can testify in their own defense, uh, and, and it's the government's burden to show that this person is a danger. That did not happen in the internment cases. There was a blanket assumption that simply being Japanese American, whether you were born in this country or born abroad, that you were, by implication, disloyal to the country. And that is the principle that Justice Breyer said, quite rightly, conflicts with the idea that guilt is individual in our society. And a couple of times you referenced Justice Scalia. He spoke at the University of Hawaii in 2014. Justice Scalia never allows cameras to come into his speeches, but we do have his words on screen to show you what he said. You are kidding yourself if you think the same thing will not happen again. In times of war, the laws fall silent. That's what was going on, the panic about the war and the invasion of the Pacific and whatnot. That's what happens. It was wrong, but I would not be surprised to see it happen again in time of war. It's no justification, but it is the reality. What's your reaction to that, Karen Korematsu? Well, unfortunately, uh, Korematsu versus the United States of 1944 is more relevant today uh, than really than it was then. Uh, and, the, and, you know, clearly the lessons uh, in many cases have not been learned. We keep, we keep um, you know, repeating these, these mistakes. And for Justice Scalia to make that quote now, uh, you know, d d during this time, is, is, is very scary. And, and that's why it's so important that we teach these, these lessons of history so we don't keep making the mistakes. Um, because, you know, we shouldn't live, uh, the Supreme Court um, and, and rule should not be in times of, uh, of of war, the fall, the law falls silent. Um, you know, we the Constitution is a is a, an important document that my father learned about, and uh, and felt that it applied to him as it should for all Americans. So there's nothing wrong with the Constitution, as some people try to to change it and or pieces of it. Um, it's just some of the people that take it and try to interpret it for their own use. Another lesson about the court is that people like Fred Korematsu can appeal their cases to it. What do you want to say about that? Well, that's one of the great things about our system mm -hmm. is that you can uh, take your case to the highest court in the land. But that doesn't mean the court is either going to hear the case because they only hear about 1% of the cases that are brought up for review to them or that they're going to rule uh, in your favor. So uh, getting to the Supreme Court is only really the first step. The, the, the most important step is how the court decides the case and what the lasting consequences of that are going to be. I don't think Justice Scalia was endorsing the internment or the Korematsu decision. In fact, he was deploring it. But what he was saying, and it's, and it's quite true, is that we're kidding ourselves if we think this can't happen again or that the courts are going to step in and say, no, you can't do it. Because the court, in the, in the end, is swayed by factors other than the text of the Constitution. They're swayed by public pressure. They're swayed by patriotism. They're swayed by personal loyalty to presidents who appointed them, to judicial philosophies. And uh, all of those things come together in a crucible of intense disagreement and debate, debate over what are we going to do as a society to protect ourselves and also to protect our citizens. So as you heard, our next week's case will be one in which the court stood up to a president, Harry Truman, during the Korean War when he tried to use executive powers to, steal, to seize the steel mills. If you're interested in these cases, I wanted to just tell you about this uh, booklet that we've put together 
that has synopsis of each one of the cases, tells you a bit about the background, as we've done at the table here tonight, uh, what happened during the case, some excerpts from the decisions, and what their legacy has been. You can find it on our website, cspan.org slash landmarkcases, and find out how you can get it uh, to your home for the rest of the series. We're just at the halfway point. Our special thanks to the National Constitution Center for their help in putting together this Landmark Cases series. And on this week's program, a thanks to Karen Korematsu and to Peter Irons for being here to tell us the story of Korematsu versus the United States. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Our series continues next Monday with the Supreme Court's 1952 decision in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company v. Sawyer. In that case, the justices affirmed the separation of powers by determining that President Truman acted beyond his authority in seizing control of the nation's steel mills during the Korean War when an imminent strike was threatening to shut down operations. The court ruled that the president's actions were unconstitutional because they had not been authorized by Congress. Congress. Find out more next Monday live at 9 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN, C-SPAN 3, and C-SPAN Radio. You can also learn more about C-SPAN's Landmark Cases series online by going to cspan.org slash landmark cases. And from the website, you can order C-SPAN's Landmark Cases book, featuring background, highlights, and the legal impact of each case. Written by veteran Supreme Court journalist Tony Morrow and public.